So here we go at the start of the carnival. Um, this talk from Ray's point of view. In the beginning, there was only darkness and heavy rain. Sudden black waters that ruffled and swarmed like a plague over the roads and fields, poured like Guinness into abandoned stairwells. Downtown, at the intersection of King Street and Spadina Avenue, a young man in hitched up plus fours tried fording one of the deepest sections of road on his bicycle. The wheels slid out from under him and he disappeared, then rose again, sputtering and indignant. Cop or not, I laughed along with the sodden crowd. Two unshaven men carrying a spineless mattress from one building to its neighbor had it ripped from their arms by the current. One of them, a showy and well-muscled lad, dove in theatrically and performed three or four impressive freestyle strokes before standing again, suddenly waist deep. He flopped aboard the rowing springs and feigned exhaustion, and I thought, bravo, bravo. No one took any of this splashy weather very seriously, even though there were reports of similar weather all over the city. The CBC's meteorologist reported matter-of-factly on the radio that a hurricane was blowing itself out over the Appalachians. His confident forecast was for a little more rain that evening and then drying out after midnight. But the sky was fierce with fat, scudding armies of cloud. And down at the lake, a debris-laden surf was beginning to wash in. There were logs and curled roofing shingles, wretched baby toys with broken or missing limbs, dislocated umbrellas and battered hubcaps, a buckled American stop sign. Commuters were clutching at lampposts and hats, yanking overcoats tight and yelling to each other quite cheerfully, almost proudly, that they couldn't remember the last time they'd seen a rain like this. The buses were packed and glowed like lanterns. Their drivers honked at the more timid drivers to give way. If it stopped soon, I thought, then there wouldn't be much of a problem, though we'd already seen a few refugees evacuating their basements, clutching their record albums, and a favorite pair of shoes or a squirming, terrified cat. But another hour or two, and this was going to lose its comic edge. Worst was the traffic. Motorcycle cops were again attempting to dr guide drivers through the shallowest sections of road. A couple of detours had been established. A drunken crowd had gathered on the roof of the Gladstone Hotel on Queen Street and taken to lobbing beer bottles into the rising sea. The fact that instead of smashing, they simply bobbed west seemed to strike them as miraculous. One idiot was scrawling messages on paper napkins and stuffing those inside the Molson's bottles, as if he'd been stranded in this overrun cattle town long ago and had finally sensed the possibility of rescue. When I found a moment, I telephoned home to tell Mary I wouldn't arrive until later, when things calmed down. She was disappointed. She'd wanted us to spend the evening together packing. We planned a trip to Niagara <coughs> Falls. She whispered, as if she might be overheard, that she pictured us in bed together tonight, riding out the storm, if I got her drift. And so I told her about the boy on the mattress. Do you think we'll still be able to go away, she asked me. You said the Queensway was flooding. We'll drive around it, I said, or we'll rent a boat. I was feeling strong, cocky even, but I was a respected policeman with a pregnant wife, and that struck me right then as the epitome of good citizenship. Everything about my predicament felt crystalline and pure. It was just the adrenaline kicking in, I suppose. I told Mary I loved her, and her throttled little gasp excited me. I thought, I'll have to do that more often. But then, feeling suddenly delinquent in my duty, somehow adrift, I said only, Mary, I've got to go. Go, go, she commanded, and I felt oddly as if I was being ordered once more out of an Italian trench and across exposed muddy fields towards tangles of barbed wire. And I also felt, with an unsettling certainty, and with that wet telephone still in my hand, that I was about to die. And I'll do that stop right there. Thank you.